9 Real Life Cabin in the Woods Mysteries That Will Make You Lock Your Doors The isolated cabin in the woods is a staple of the horror genre, Friday the 13th, Cabin Fever, The Evil Dead, and, of course, The Cabin in the Woods. It is a haunting setting for a murder because you never know what may be lurking outside your cabin in that isolated place, and that is exactly the horror that the people on this list experienced. 1. The Blue Mountain Shootings, a 15-year-old who shot and killed his foster father and another man at a remote Oregon cabin in 2012, never meant to kill anyone and never should have been around loaded guns due to his lack of maturity, after years of abuse and other problems, a defense lawyer says. The boy made admissions Wednesday in Grant County Court in Canyon City to the juvenile equivalent of manslaughter. A judge ordered him into state custody until he turns 25, when he will be eligible for release. Defense attorney Kathy Berger said, The boy told authorities he got scared and accidentally shot the men, foster father Michael Pyatt of Baker City and Pyatt's uncle, Kenneth Gilliland, during a hunting trip. Unfortunately, two people died as a result of some decisions that when you look back on them, you are left just shaking your head, what in the world were you thinking? Berger said, Grant County District Attorney Ryan Jocelyn did not immediately return a call for comment. Berger said the boy was abused as a young child and went into a series of foster homes and juvenile care facilities where he displayed behavioral problems. He was sent to live with the Pyatt and his wife despite a lack of local treatment services available to him. When he started high school, the first public school he ever attended on his own, he was soon tossed out. Pyatt had planned a hunting trip with his uncle and friends. Rather than place the teen with someone else while he was gone, he took him along to do chores as a sort of punishment, Berger said. Events at the cabin are unclear, and the boy's statement to state police conflicts with the evidence in some respects, Berger said. According to his statement, which was played in open court at an earlier hearing, the boy got hold of a loaded .44 Magnum revolver. He had heard there were wolves around, and thinking he saw a pair of eyes in the darkness, he fired, hitting Gilliland. Then he went inside the cabin where he got more scared because people were yelling at him. The boy fired wildly toward the upstairs loft, where others in the party were sleeping. A bullet passed through a bookcase and hit Pyatt, who was standing after being awakened by the gunfire. The boy grabbed a rifle on his way out the door, and while outside, fell and shot himself in the leg with a revolver. Using the rifle as a crutch, he made his way back to the cabin. One of the other men had driven to the little town of Granite to call 911. Another taped the boy to a chair until deputies arrived. The boy was taken to a Boise hospital, where he was interviewed by a state police detective. The Associated Press is withholding the boy's name due to his age. Was it reckless for him to pick up guns? Yes it was, Berger said. Was it reckless for him to shoot the guns? Very reckless. When you look through the decisions made by professional people and adults who were supposed to be looking out for the boy, due to his needs, it's just a tragedy. The boy originally was held on juvenile charges of aggravated murder, and prosecutors tried to have him tried as an adult. A judge denied the request after experts examined the boy and found he had the maturity of a nine-year-old. State law bars anyone younger than 12 from being tried as an adult. 2. The Aikman Murders The man who killed Grand Ole Opry star David Stringman Aikman and his wife in 1973, has been granted parole and will be released from prison. John A. Brown, 63, appeared before five of the seven members of the Tennessee Board of Parole on Wednesday. Four of them voted to grant his request for parole, enough to secure his release. Board spokeswoman Melissa McDonald said it could take several weeks before Brown gets out of the facility where he is being held. On the evening of November 10, 1973, Brown and his cousin, Doug Marvin Brown, ambushed Takeman and his wife, Estelle, as they returned home from the Opry. Stringbin was known to carry a lot of cash, and the Brown cousins had been looking for it in the Aikman's cabin in Ridgetop, 20 miles north of Nashville. John Brown shot Stringbin as he walked into cabin. He then chased Estelle across her front yard and shot her in the back of the head as she begged for mercy. Both men were convicted and sentenced to serve two life sentences in prison. Doug Brown died in prison in 2003. Brown has appeared before the parole board six times in the decades, since he was incarcerated for the murders that rocked Music City. Country music legends have lined up to keep Brown behind bars, why should they turn him loose? 
Country Music Hall of Famer Gene Shepard asked, he cold-bloodedly killed two friends of ours. In the days leading to a hearing in 2011, Bill Anderson started an email campaign encouraging people to write letters against his release. Opry member Jan Howard spoke, banjo player Grandpa Jones found the Aikman's bodies the morning after they were killed. His wife, Ramona Jones, was one of the first people on the scene. She said she thinks about her friends each day. She wrote a letter to the parole board in advance of Brown's latest hearing. He still murdered two very innocent people, she said in April. Don't let him out, Mac Wiseman, who will be inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame later this month, called the board's decision a great miscarriage of justice. It makes me question the legal system, he said. Wiseman said he did not discount Brown's contrition. But he did question how a man with two life sentences could be released. I fully believe that the good Lord forgives us for our mistakes, he said. But, Wiseman added, members of the parole board don't have the authority, spiritually or otherwise, to forgive that man, I don't think. 3. The Brooks Murders Two teens accused of murdering a vacationing couple in Stone County will face criminal charges as adults. The adult court criminal charging documents also provide more information about the circumstances before and after the deaths of Paul and Margaret Brooks. Anthony Zaro, now 17, of Spring, Texas and Christopher Allen, now 16, of Nashville, Tennessee have each been charged with two counts of first-degree murder three counts of armed criminal action, one count of felony robbery and one count of felony burglary. Circuit Court Judge Alan Blankenship issued a ruling today certifying the boys as adults. Stone prosecutor Matt Selby filed the criminal case shortly thereafter. There was no evidence that the juvenile would benefit from treatment in a juvenile facility. Given the seriousness and particularly violent and vicious nature of the offenses, the age of the juvenile and the limited time for rehabilitating someone who is charged with these particular offenses, and the fact that no evidence was adduced to demonstrate the availability of a facility which could guarantee the juvenile's confinement, it is apparent that there are no reasonable prospects for rehabilitation, Blankenship wrote in the certification of decision. The statement contains information from Stone County Detective Matt Maggard. He said the lives under construction boys ranch where both teens were residents reported the boys missing on January 29. They had last been seen about 7 p.m. that day. Then, on the 31st, the ranch again called authorities. Ranch staffers reported property damage to their main office which likely happened between 4 a.m. and 7.30 a.m. that day. The reporting party stated nothing was stolen from the office but believed the suspects were looking for the keys to the boys' ranch vehicles, which were removed from the office after Anthony and Christopher had ran away, the report said. Later that evening at about 5.22 p.m. the Stone County Sheriff's Office received a call from a neighbor along Trace Hollow Road. Previous court documents have said that neighbor told authorities he saw two juveniles taking items from the home where the Brookses had been vacationing, as well as another nearby home. He said the two juveniles were loading items into a blue Saturn he knew to be owned by the Brookses. The neighbor took the keys from the car and held the two teens at gunpoint until authorities arrived. Previous court documents said the neighbor's name is not mentioned in any of the documents the news leader has obtained to date. When deputies arrived on scene, Zaro and Alan were detained and asked if there were any other people in the home. Anthony stated to deputies that two other people were inside and stated I killed them. I beat them with a baseball bat and stabbed them. The probable cause statement said deputies found the Brookses in the bedroom of the home. The probable cause statement said the couple was likely killed in the kitchen and then dragged into the back bedroom of the home. There was also evidence, authorities say that someone had been trying to clean the crime scene. Both boys were detained, their clothes spattered with blood. Records say both boys had ID and bank cards of both victims, the statement said. Inside the car, authorities found a wooden bed post with what appeared to be blood on it, the statement said. Authorities believe that was one of the murder weapons. The other, neighboring home sustained more than $750 damage to the interior of the house. Previous court documents revealed holes punched in walls and cuts made in furniture. Authorities believe the bed post came from that home. Both Zero and Allen are scheduled to make their first criminal court appearance on Friday. 4. The Russell Murders It was the sort of crime that left the nation in shock. 
a mother and her two young daughters and their dog walking in a beautiful country setting across a wild flower meadow. The sun was shining and the only sound was that of bees and skylarks and then suddenly, from nowhere, a maniac with a hammer wreaks savage murder on them. That's what happened on July 9, 1996, near the village of Chilendon, Kent. The so-called Garden of England, Lynn Russell had been taking a quiet stroll through the lanes and meadows with her little girls, Josie, aged nine, and Megan who was six. They were accompanied by their small dog Lucy. Then they were suddenly confronted by a man. No one can be absolutely sure what happened next. No one knows if he demanded money from Lynn Russell or whether it was a random incident driven only by a boiling desire within to kill. The family were tied up with the killer's own bootlaces and the dog lead. They were being controlled, whimpering with fear and pleading not to be hurt. Did those pleas fall on deaf ears, or did they just serve to inflame the killer's evil nature? It seems Lynn Russell was the first to die, clubbed to the ground with a heavy hammer. Then little Megan was killed her skull shattered by more vicious blows with a tool. Then Josie was battered and left bleeding. Even their little dog had to die. Did she try and defend her family? The exact truth will never be known. Whatever happened, her skull was stoven by another crushing hammer blow. Then the killer, his clothes spattered with the blood of his victims, left the scene. When a passerby found the scene of carnage and called an ambulance, it seemed that all three victims were dead. But Josie still had a pulse. At hospital neurosurgeons carried out a series of delicate operations, and gradually, over a period of a year or more, Josie pulled through and recovered. News of the incident shocked and distressed the whole community. Crime in Kent was not unknown, but nothing as bad as this had taken place in living memory in the county. For the police, the crime scene yielded few scientific clues and Josie, fighting for her life in hospital, was in no condition, at least not for many months, to talk about or describe what had happened. Detectives began to search their own records for anyone who could be remotely responsible for such a heinous crime. Hundreds of men with convictions for violence were researched, interviewed, and eliminated. Then, in July 1997, a year after the murders, Detectives questioned and then arrested 37-year-old Michael Stone. Since he was a child he had been involved in crime, starting by stealing from shops when he was 12, to burglary and armed robbery. As he grew his crimes became more violent. He had hit people before with hammers and crowbars. He had been assessed by psychiatrists as a psychopath and schizophrenic who thought he was a danger to the public and should be in a psychiatric hospital. But at the time mental health legislation it was only legal to detain someone if their condition was considered treatable. Stone's condition was considered untreatable, so he was allowed to be free. Part of Stone's modus operandi on occasions, was to drive into the rural part of Kent and break into remote houses and farms. He needed cash to support his heroin addiction. He had robbed several sub-post offices in quiet villages. On the day of the Russell murders someone had stolen a motor mower from a garden in the next village to Chilendon. The owner had seen a car drive off, but could not get the number. But he remembered the make and color. When police checked, they found Stone owned an identical car at that time. There was only circumstantial evidence against Stone but he was charged and remanded in custody. It was while he was in jail awaiting trial that police got an important breakthrough. In the next cell was Damien Daly, a career criminal with many convictions behind him. The pair discovered there was a small hole around a heating pipe running between their cells, and through this tiny gap they could have conversations. It was through this gap that Daly said Stone made a full confession to him about the chill and murders, including details only the killer could have known. At trial Daly was described as a liar, who would say anything to gain an advantage. But Nigel Sweeney QC for the Crown said Daly had nothing at all to gain by lying about what Michael Stone told him. Mr. Dot Sweeney told the jury, we have to make you sure that Stone confessed and to help them understand, they were taken to the jail to see the space around the heating pipe between the two cells. To demonstrate that humans could communicate through it clearly, a member of the prosecution team read extracts from a Harry Potter book through the gap while the jury listened in the other cell. The jury were convinced. Stone, who had pleaded not guilty, was convicted in 1998, and jailed for life. The Court of Appeal later ordered a retrial after a prosecution witness recanted his evidence. But at the Old Bailey in 2001, a new jury convicted Stone again. In December 2006, 
a high court judge ruled that Stone was so dangerous he should not be considered for release until 2023, when he served a minimum of 25 years. The Stone case forced the government to make changes to the Mental Health Act meaning that people considered mentally ill and highly dangerous can be held in secure psychiatric hospitals against their will for the protection of the public. 5. The McDowell Family Murder In June 1989, the McDowell family, which consisted of 59-year-old Robert, 48-year-old Elizabeth, 23-year-old Eben, and 22-year-old Daniel, were staying with grandfather, 73-year-old Charles Klepater, in a cabin in the woods in Stamford, New York. On June 22, Eben left the cabin, drove to his father's office, and left a note on the door. Eben then drove back to the cabin and, once there, he took a shotgun and shot every family member to death. His grandfather was found in his bed, his brother and father were found near a pond on the property, and his mother's body was found in the pond. State police at Sydney said Eben McDowell was shot and killed about 4.45 p.m. near Murphy's Pond outside the village of Stamford about 55 miles southwest of Albany. State troopers said they were engaged in a dialogue with McDowell when he suddenly opened fire on them, apparently with the same shotgun he allegedly used to kill his family Wednesday. Troopers and sheriff's deputies from two counties returned fire and McDowell was killed. The area, located near the Deer Run Ski Resort in Delaware County, was cordoned off as more than 30 troopers along with Delaware and Schoharie County deputies converged on the area, police said. McDowell is believed to have shot and killed his father, mother, brother and grandfather sometime Wednesday, police said. Police identified the victims as Robert McDowell, 59, Elizabeth McDowell, 48, Daniel McDowell, 22, and Charles Klepater, 78. Troopers said Klepater was Elizabeth McDowell's father. Police said the four bodies were discovered Thursday morning with gunshot wounds in a hunting cabin in Stamford. About noon Thursday, troopers put out an all-points bulletin saying McDowell had taken a pickup truck registered to his father and was considered armed and dangerous. Police said they tracked McDowell later in the afternoon to Murphy's Pond located off a single rural road outside Stamford. Autopsy reports on the four victims found in the cabin are pending, officials said. Meanwhile, someone visiting the office found the note on the door, which had been written to make it look like Robert had committed the murders. Using a helicopter, the police tracked Heaven to another pond a little ways down the road. Police confronted him, and a standoff ensued. After about six hours, Evan started firing and the police returned fire, killing him. Eben had been diagnosed with schizophrenia, and he previously had violent episodes. In one incident, Eben had attacked his father with an axe. Due to his episodes, he had been hospitalized a number of times prior to the murders. 6. The Henry Cowell Redwoods State Park Murders When the news of the murder of Father Henri Domey, 64, appeared in California's Sentinel newspaper on November 4, 1972, everyone was stunned. A Roman Catholic priest who was stabbed and stomped to death in a church confessional may have surprised a thief. The report read, Father Domey was brutally murdered Thursday afternoon by a tall, young man in dark clothing and black boots. It went on. A woman entering the church during the struggle told the police the young man repeatedly stabbed the 64-year-old, a Los Gatos police official said. Three months later, in February 1973, there was a brutal shooting, one afternoon. Fred Perez, 72, was leading the front lawn of his house in Santa Cruz, California when, suddenly, a station wagon pulled up. A tall, young man in dark clothing climbed out of the driver's seat, laid a rifle across the bonnet, aimed and fired. Fred was killed instantly, but his neighbor had seen it all, even managed to get the car's number plate. That afternoon, the killer was arrested. He was Herbert Mullen. 26, and a police search of his apartment turned up Father Domey's rosary beads. They also found newspaper articles about other recent, unsolved murders, and an address book with lists of victims. The police had uncovered a serial killer they didn't even know they were looking for. The murders had been unconnected because, each time, Mullen had killed using different methods. His victims were all different. 2. Men, women, young, old. Herbert Mullen was born in 1947, in Salinas, California. A good boy who'd done well at school, 
He'd even been voted most likely to succeed by classmates. But then it all started to go wrong for him. At 18, his best friend Dean was killed in a car accident. The two had been close. Some even thought they were lovers. Dean's death hit Mullen hard, and he built a shrine to Dean in his bedroom, with photos and trinkets. Soon after, Mullen told his family he was gay. But what worried them was his erratic behavior, as he spent more and more time alone. Then, one night in February 1969, when he was 21, Mullen started imitating his brother-in-law over the dinner table. Uncontrollable copying, echopraxia, is an early sign of schizophrenia. With his family's support, Mullen committed himself to a mental hospital. Only, weeks later, he discharged himself. For the next few years, it was a pattern that would repeat itself. Between hospital visits, Mullen tried to self-medicate with cannabis and LSD. But then, three years later, the voices started, at first telling him he was destined for great things. His birthday was 18 April, after all, the same date as Albert Einstein's. Mullen didn't need any more persuading. Then the voices pointed out that 18 April was also the date of the last massive earthquake in San Francisco. In 1906, 80% of the city had been destroyed, and some 3,000 people killed. Mullen believed that another earthquake was imminent. Suddenly, he saw his destiny. He'd been born to save Californians from another quake, by murdering them. His first victim was Lawrence White, a homeless man. Lawrence, 55, had been walking along the Santa Cruz Mountain Road when Mullen drove past. It was late. Mullen stopped his car, and, Using a baseball bat, he beat the man to death. But one murder wouldn't be enough to stop the earthquake. Two weeks later, on October 24, 1972, Mullen picked up hitchhiker Mary Guilfoyle, 24, stabbed her in the chest, then cut her up and scattered her along the highway. His next victim had been Father Omey. Mullen told police he'd gone into St. Mary's Church to confess, but thought Father Omey had offered himself up as the next sacrifice. Herbert Mullen killed 13 people in total. He confessed to his crimes and was charged with 10 counts of first-degree murder. But Mullen denied the charges. He claimed he'd been insane, so wasn't responsible. Six months later, in August 1973, he stood trial, and a number of expert witnesses agreed that he was insane, that his crimes had been committed mindlessly, except that not all had. On January 25, 1973, Mullen had set out to kill James Gynra, 25, who he'd known from high school. James had sold him cannabis, and, to Mullen, that made him responsible for everything. The two hadn't seen each other in years, but Mullen tracked down James, then shot him and his wife dead. Lawyers said it was a premeditated crime. The jury agreed Dot and Mullen was found guilty of two counts of first-degree murder and nine of second-degree murder. In 1973, Herbert Mullen was sentenced to life in prison, and won't be eligible for parole until 2021, when he's 74. 7. The Teed Cabin Murders It's a rare crime, but the type of crime that strikes fear in our hearts. Absolute strangers break into a home. The family is held hostage at gunpoint. A young woman watches helplessly as her mother and grandmother are murdered before her eyes, and the violence escalates without any provocation from the victims. The Teed sisters share their story of survival on 48 Hours Live to Tell. Three days before Christmas, the crime took place in a remote family cabin in Oakley, Utah. The two men who murdered Beth Potts and Kay Teed also shot Kay's husband, Rolf, and left him for dead. They doused him with gasoline set a fire, and took off with two hostages, 20-year-old Lenny Teed and her 16-year-old sister, Trisha. The men were caught red-handed after a high-speed chase. Both were parolees who walked away from a halfway house. They stood together in court as a multitude of charges were read, but then their cases went their separate ways through the justice system. There were different lawyers, different juries, and different procedures. Von Taylor ended up being sentenced to death. Edward Dele got life. According to the surviving victims, the two men participated equally in the crimes, so why did they end up with different fates? It's not uncommon for one suspect to turn on another in order to get a break. That's not what happened here, neither man cooperated. The investigators had to piece the evidence together themselves. They believed they had two ironclad cases. One especially chilling piece, a video shot by Delhi with the Teed family's camera while the men laid in wait. In it. 
an arm Taylor gleefully rips open the family's Christmas presents. Taylor pleaded guilty to two murders. In exchange, the other charges were dropped, but he still had to go before a jury who would decide his sentence, life in prison or death. He testified, but judging from the transcripts, he did himself no favor. He was argumentative and had convenient memory lapses. He remembered pointing a gun, but not shooting it. It happened so quickly, I don't know, he testified. He showed little remorse. The jury sentenced him to death. Edward Delhi chose to go to trial. His attorney argued that it was Taylor who did all the shooting and he subjected the Teed sisters to grueling cross-examination. The verdict, second-degree murder, which meant the death penalty was no longer an option. The family was stunned. How could this man not be held fully accountable for what happened that day? The jurors said there was one holdout. The rest realized that a hung jury would mean subjecting the family to yet another trial so they compromised and convicted on the lesser offense. While Delhi seems to have accepted his fate, Taylor has repeatedly appealed his sentence. In his third trip to the Utah Supreme Court, his current attorney claims that the autopsies show that Taylor is factually innocent. Even though he admits firing the first shots, he says that the fatal wounds came from Delhi's gun and that Lenny has been inconsistent in her accounts. The state disputes all this and is defending the sentence. Taylor remains on death row. So, was justice served? It was in that both men were removed from society immediately after the crime. It is highly unlikely that Delhi will ever get out of prison. But, thanks to that holdout juror, he still has his life. Anti-death penalty advocates point to this case as an example of how arbitrary capital punishment can be, but, so far, the fates of these two men have not been all that different. Like Delhi, Taylor has spent the past 21 years behind bars, Linny and Trisha vow to be there when he is executed. They'll have to be patient. According to an assistant attorney general, they are not at the end of the process. Even if Taylor loses at every juncture, he'll probably be around for several more years. 8. The Torian Cabin Murders In the case of Sean Wilkins and Roy Buckner v. De Reyes, Jacoby and Fenner, a federal jury addressed the issue of the scope of police interrogations, and how far an interrogation can go before it becomes coercive. The civil case against the investigating officers went to trial in the U.S. District Court for the District of New Mexico in October of 2010, almost 15 years after the murders took place. On April 14, 1996, Ben Anaya, Sr. found four badly decomposed bodies in a remote cabin he owned near the village of Torian, in the Manzano Mountains outside of Albuquerque, N.M. One was that of his son, Ben Anaya, Jr., age 17. Another adult was Ben's girlfriend, Cassandra Sadillo, age 23. The other two bodies were those of Sadillo's two boys, ages 3 and 4. Investigators would later find out that both the adults had been shot, while the boys were left locked in the cabin with no way to escape. The children ultimately died of starvation and dehydration. The murders became known as the Torian Cabin Homicides. An initial investigation was conducted by the county sheriff's office, but they quickly turned it over to the New Mexico State Police due to lack of resources. Captain. Michael Fenner and Agent Frank Jacoby were assigned. They recognized gang involvement and requested assistance from the Albuquerque Police Department gang unit. Officer Wanda Reyes was assigned to the investigative team. Within days, the intense investigation focused on two members of the 18th Street Gang, Sean Wilkins and Roy Bucknor. Captain Fenner and Officer de Reyes conducted the majority of the interviews and interrogations, questioning gang members their families and anyone who might have knowledge of what happened at the cabin. They made traffic stops of known gang members and used gang databases to identify associates. There was very little physical evidence due to the amount of time that had passed between the murders and the discovery of the bodies. With the assistance of investigative polygraphs, a story began to emerge. Sometime in December of 1995, Ben, Sadillo and her two boys went out to the cabin to hide out from gang members who were involved in a dispute with Ben. Sean Popliski, Popcorn, went with them. Popliski had been ranked out of the gang, because the other gang members thought he was a snitch, but Ben had remained friends with him. Ben had been in a high position in the gang, a position coveted by Wilkins. They all partied for some time, using cocaine and other drugs, as well as drinking. The three visitors, Wilkins, Bucknor, and another gang member, Lawrence Nito, left the cabin, 
presumably heading back to the city, and Ben and Sedillo went to bed. However, the three gang members returned to the cabin on foot. While Nito held Popliski on the ground at gunpoint, Wilkins and Buckner went back into the cabin and shot the two adults. As they left, they locked the door from the outside with a deadbolt. Popliski ran off into the woods. The other three left carrying Ben's guns and drugs. Popliski later made his way back into the city in Ben's Jeep, which was later found abandoned in Pecos, Texas. Popliski later claimed, I thought everyone in the cabin was dead to excuse the fact that he never made a call for someone to find the children. After several years of legal wrangling in the criminal law arena and trips to the Court of Appeals, Nito and Popliski were convicted as accomplices to the murders. Nito was called to testify in Buckner's trial and recanted his statements that Wilkins and Buckner were the killers, and testified that Officer DeRays and Agent Jacoby pressured him into giving that testimony by harassing me and stuff. Wilkins and Buckner's juries were unable to reach a verdict. Prosecutors filed a null prosecute, indicating that there was insufficient evidence and error that would have serious implications years later in the civil suit. Because one of the elements of a malicious prosecution claim is the termination of the underlying action in favor of the plaintiff, the court held that the phrase insufficient evidence constituted termination in favor, where a hung jury wouldn't have. In 2002, Wilkins and Buckner filed a lawsuit for civil rights violations and malicious prosecution against the officers, alleging that their interrogation techniques were so aggressive as to have coerced Popliski and Nito into giving false testimony implicating them in the murders. A key issue in the suit was an allegation that Officer DeRays carried a vendetta against Wilkins because of a drive-by shooting that had occurred at Officer DeRays' home for which DeRay suspected Wilkins. The plaintiffs alleged that all of the officers knew they were contriving false charges against innocent men. By the time the case came up for trial, all of the officers had retired, but each of them spent countless hours in preparation for their testimony. The plaintiffs alleged that the officers contrived a story of how the murders occurred and then, through the use of leading questions, planted their version of events in the minds of Popliski and Nito until they told the story the officers wanted to hear. And NBSP, they alleged that it was Officer DeRays and Captain Fenner who brought their names into the investigation, and that they coerced information that was false. They claimed that the interrogations were held while the suspects were in custody and that requests for an attorney were denied. The case against the officers at trial focused on what interrogation methods are acceptable, and when officers cross the line into a civil rights violation, all of the interrogations were videotaped. Jurors viewed hours of the tapes, and both sides made arguments about the propriety of the interrogation methods. Nito was still in state custody at the time of the trial. When called to testify, he pleaded the Fifth Amendment and gave no useful testimony. Popliski had been paroled but disappeared shortly after his release and did not testify. Wilkins and Buckner testified as to how they had been framed for the murders, and claimed damages for the emotional distress of pretrial incarceration at the penitentiary of New Mexico as pretrial detainees. The prosecuting attorney, Madeline Melka, testified that she had overseen all of the interrogations and found them completely appropriate. She confirmed that no threats or promises had been issued to the suspects. She also approved the arrest warrants captain. Jacoby drafted and had them approved by a magistrate. Plaintiffs argued that the intimidating demeanor of the officers, as well as the length of the interrogation sessions, and how and where they were conducted, violated their civil rights and terrified Nito and Popliski into giving false information. They also alleged that the officers presented fabricated testimony to official bodies. Attorneys for the officers noted that the suspects were hardened gang members, leading lives of crime who'd been questioned by police many times in the past. The law enforcement defendants further pointed out that, in each instance, the suspects had come in voluntarily, and were free to leave at all times, that none of the sessions lasted more than a couple of hours, and they all took place in a state police office. At no time were there physical threats or deprivation of food, water or bathroom privileges. Moreover, the statements ultimately elicited were corroborated by investigative polygraphs of Nito, Popliski and Wilkins. The jury found unanimously in favor of the police defendants. One woman commented that this wasn't anything I don't do to my kids when they won't give me a straight story. The case clearly illustrates that an aggressive law enforcement interrogation does not have to cross the line to be successful. Unfortunately, 
It took many years for these officers to be vindicated. 9. The Goodhart Murders It's widely considered the most notorious crime in northern Michigan's history, a family of six, all found murdered in their Emmett County cottage. It's been 46 years since, and still, the Robison family murders are unsolved. Evan Dean takes us through the many twists and turns of this case in part 3 of our special series, Mysteries of Northern Michigan. It kind of seems like a place apart, said author Marty Link, a picturesque town along the shore of Lake Michigan. I know Northern Michigan is beautiful, but it's particularly beautiful. A Nemet County getaway spot, known for its beauty? but also made famous by a tragedy that happened decades ago. Sheriff Pete Wallen said, Even to this day, it's hard to imagine some this horrendous could have happened in the sleepy little town like Goodhart. It was the summer of 1968. A well-to-do family from Oakland County was spending their summer at a vacation home, that once sat right along this empty property. But in July, the Robison summer cottage turned into the scene of a gruesome mass murder. It was a pretty grisly scene. They had been shot and the young daughter had been bludgeoned to death. All six members of the Robison family, Richard and Shirley, and their four kids, Richie, Gary, Randy and Susan, all found dead. Even more horrific, their bodies weren't discovered until weeks after they were murdered. They were badly deteriorated. It was a pretty ugly scene. Who would do such a brutal crime? Marty asks. And what could the motive possibly be? The local deputies weren't used to cases like this. They quickly called in the Michigan State Police. It obviously wasn't a murder-suicide, they knew that. So they started looking at the neighbors. There was a tree trimmer that had been hired to trim their trees. They interviewed him and all his helpers. I know they just about emptied any halfway house, mental institution. They interviewed people at the state hospital, but all the while, police were actually starting to zero in on one man. Their person of interest at the time was Mr. Robison's business partner, Mr. Scolaro, explained Sheriff Wallen. This downstate man, Joe Scolaro, who worked as a salesman for Richard Robison's advertising company, the evidence against him quickly started piling up. There's time lapses in his alibi. It looked like Richard had just discovered that Joe had been stealing money from the company, said Marty. Wallen states, appears to have been some embezzling. There was like $60,000 missing, and that's not all investigators uncovered as they dug deeper into Joe Scolaro. He was also an amateur marksman, Marty explained. He would travel around the state of Michigan and compete in trap shooting events and win. They went to a firing range where Mr. Scolaro used to shoot, Sheriff Wallen said, and they found 22 shell casings at the range that matched the ones at the scene of the crime. After a 15-month investigation, police presented their case against Joe Scolaro to the Emmett County prosecutor, but weeks went by, and an arrest warrant was never issued. There was quite a bit of evidence at the time, but had they had the murder weapon and few more fingerprints, I think the prosecutor, Mr. Noggle, would have issued warrants. Joe Scolaro was a free man. It looked like the Robison family murders would go unsolved. But a few years later, a break in the case. An ambitious prosecutor down in Oakland County decided, hey the victims were from here, maybe I can get an indictment, said Marty. And they did. In March of 1973, Joe Scolaro was to be arrested and charged with murdering the Robisons. But Joe had learned of the impending charges. And when police went to arrest him, a stunning discovery. The officers went in and they found him dead by his own hand. He had shot himself in the head with a Beretta handgun. The prime suspect in the Robison family murders had taken his own life, and left behind, was a lengthy suicide note. Sheriff Wallen explained, he says I'm a liar and a cheat but I didn't kill the Robisons. Do you believe what he said? He failed polygraphs. He says he's a liar and a cheat and a phony. You figure it out. Almost 41 years have passed. New technology has emerged. Evidence has been retested for DNA, but it hasn't helped. And more than four decades after their deaths, the Robison family murders are still unsolved. The case continues to be open. Maybe someday the murder weapon will get discovered. Until that time, it'll stay open. And it may remain a mystery for years to come. And for some, one big question still remains. I've always questioned, a family of six, how one person could do it. The question is, did he do it himself, or was there somebody involved with him? That's the question.